But culture doesn't change all at once, and can lead to culture shock within a culture. Conflict theory points out that as a heterosexual cisgender majority is dominant, those who challenge their power to set norms may face opposition, either with informal sanctions in the streets or through formal institutions such as government. But cultural relativism for gender role deviance is growing among some parts of the population. When one aspect or group in society changes faster than others, we call it culture lag. Culture lag can cause resentment, violence, and many potential dysfunctions in social structures. In industrial and post-industrial societies, the material culture of technology can change far faster than formal norms and values. Informal norms can adapt quickly, especially among those most accustomed to changing technology. Texting and driving has become a major danger that law enforcement struggles to control, but it is more than twice as common among millennials, born in the two decades before 2000, than among baby boomers, born in the middle of the century. Culture lag can take the form of generation gaps, as young people tend to place high value in progress, while older people tend to prioritize tradition. Culture shock between generations, with each assuming its own ways are best, can lead to ageism. It has been said that America is heaven for the young and hell for the old, but both may suffer from age stereotypes and discrimination. This chart makes humorous comparisons between generational cultures. Norms for work, sex, music, and life goals have changed greatly. Lee Iacocca, automobile innovator born in 1924, and Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook founder born in 1984, display very different role norms for the status of business leader. These differences hint at both a difference in generational culture and in the subcultures associated with those particular industries. Within any culture, often among adolescents, which we'll talk about in the next module, subcultures can diverge from the dominant culture, with new styles of dress, speech, behavior, and even values and beliefs. When Simba befriends Timon and Pumbaa, he learns their norms of jungle living and eating grubs, and also their value of Hakuna Matata, no worries. But is every deviance a new cultural norm? Not if only a few individuals are innovating within their own personality. But when others begin to learn from them, and it diffuses out into a larger group, then it becomes a cultural trait. Subcultures often develop around a shared activity or interest. For punks, it was the styles and attitudes developed in punk music. Nerds reclaimed the label and roles others placed upon them for their interest in activities formerly seen as uncool. For jocks, it was the norms of sports teams. For each of these groups, different values lead to different cultural capital, the knowledge, skills, looks, and possessions that are seen as valuable within that group. For punks, it might be your mohawk that gives you status or your knowledge of punk rock bands, while for jocks, it might be your jersey or athletic skill. These can help build social capital, getting to know important people within the group. Like economic capital, America's dollar versus the British pound, each group has its own ideas of what is valuable. Hipsters are an interesting subculture in that almost no one claims to be a hipster. It's a label placed by other people. Hipsters generally reject the notion that they fit into a specific group, valuing instead the ideals of independence and cultural freedom. Yet in reality, together, they superficially assimilate traits from other cultures, with no particular appreciation for their symbolic meaning. As hipsters are commonly members of the dominant cultural group, members of minority groups may take offense at their use of other groups' cultural capital. Subcultures can also develop from the influence of ethnic groups on the fringes of the dominant culture. Amish immigrants eventually became a counterculture when they rejected the changing norms and new technologies of the larger American society. African Americans were long segregated against their will, causing some cultural diversions, and some rejected assimilation as a means of acceptance, instead forming groups like the Black Panthers to fight back against racism and white European cultural dominance. When such countercultural movements use violence in their opposition, they're often labeled terrorists. But hippies who rejected violence were perhaps the best known American counterculture, breaking from the dominant group to pursue new norms and values. While the hyenas are presented as the bad guys in Lion King, one could argue that they are a counterculture that formed after generations of segregation from the dominant society. When we say countercultures reject aspects of the dominant culture, what does that mean in a multicultural society? The dominant culture is that of the most powerful group, and it is their cultural capital that holds the greatest value for most official statuses. So while a mohawk may make you a good punk, 
it will likely get you fired from most professional jobs. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, hired recent immigrants to work in his factories and tried to help them assimilate into American society. He did so in a rite of passage which he called the melting pot, in which they climbed into a giant pot wearing their traditional clothing and emerged not with a mixture of cultural traits, but in the clothes of the dominant wasp, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture. They left their own ethnic culture behind to assimilate to that considered valuable by the dominant group. Finally, even within that dominant group, there are cultural differences based on class. The highest value is placed on the cultural capital of the wealthiest and most powerful members of society. This is high culture. If you want to impress a politician or a CEO, you don't take them to a football game, but to a golf club.